Good morning, my friends. We have been uh, struggling with technical issues, and we still are, so there you have it. But we are making a recording, and some of you are going to see it live, <clears throat> and you will all be able to see it later. So let's start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Master Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, dear friend and guide Swami Kriyananda, humbly we bow to you all. Help us to feel your living presence within that we may <clears throat> <clears throat> that we may move through life with calm confidence, knowing that we are moving in your light, acting in your name, and doing our best, whatever our best might be, to live up to the highest that is within us. We are your children. Guide us and bless us. Om peace. Amen. Okay, my friends, we are at the stage in our story about karma reincarnation and the chakras, where I want to talk about uh, just as, as, as much as I am able to, because I'm, I'm, I'm talking f from a degree of intuitive understanding, but not from the level of direct realization that uh, Swamiji was able to offer to me. Um, but here, here's, here's what we're working with. We, we, the last time we had a session, we talked about how the chakras, we're using a different way of talking about the chakras now, where we talk about firm commitment to the material world as a reality, and the understanding that the spiritual world is the only reality. And the picture that I set up is that every single time we, 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 we think, we act, we feel, we speak. We're, we're motivated by our perception of reality. It's just as simple as that. That's just how it works. And what the, what the process is and why reincarnation takes place, as I, as I was explaining, but I'm summarizing so we'll really understand this. Because our perspective... Uh, for many millions of lifetimes is egoically based. And what that means is self-definition is limited to the senses and the perceptions that I can have here. And I talked about the, the sixth chakra having two poles. And we either have our sense of self at the medulla, which is the egoic pole, or we have our sense of self between the eyebrows, which is the um, I am one with the spirit perspective. And, and because everything is actually energy, what, what is going on in this universe, not, I mean, when, if everything is energy, the mere shedding of a material body does, does not in itself shift the energy pattern. It shifts the experience that the individual jiva is having but it doesn't, it doesn't automatically dissolve all those identifications, all those self-definitions, all those experiences. So every time we do anything, the energy of what we do is registered in the, each, in the, in the chakra. Now the word chakra means wheel. That's what, that's what it is. Um, the spinning wheel uh, the, on the flag of India because Gandhi was dedicated to the spinning wheel. So you have the chakra, which also meant the spinning wheel because he was trying to bring India to a simpler way of living. That's all b beside the point. But the chakra is wheel. And the word vritti, of vritti is a whirlpool. And so we, we speak of vrittis in the spine lodged in the chakras. All of this is about energy patterns. The chakras themselves, it's an energy field. It's not, a, it's not a physical thing that you can hold in your hand. Someone wrote to me once and had had a hysterectomy and was told that their second chakra had been removed by the surgeon. 
and they were very concerned. I wrote back and I said, that would be quite a surgeon. I just don't think it could be done. So you can mess around with the physical manifestation of the energy pattern and you can change the manifestation. You know, like you can remove a hysterectomy, but that is because the energy is concentrated, the chakra is concentrated, and the energy of the chakra has come out and made a physical thing. But changing the physical thing doesn't affect the chakra. So this is how, this is the fundamental principle of how karma is carried from lifetime to lifetime. So I have referred on many occasions to karma being unlearned lessons unlearned lessons about the nature of reality. And I've emphasized this many times in this series. I don't have to say it again, but I want you to keep it in mind. So when, for example, I win a gold medal in my school because I was very smart and I answered all the questions right, and I win the gold medal, but instead of thinking a gold medal was won, you know, energy was put out in the form of good poetry, let's say. A gold medal was awarded, and that was just something that happened. Uh, I say, I won the gold medal because I wrote the poetry, and then I was recognized. And in my chakras at the appropriate place. Now, if I, if I realized that the poetry was given to me by, by God. I didn't have anything to do with this poetry. Even if I know it came through me, there's no sense of pride, there's no self-definition, there's no self-worth related to having won the gold medal, there's no walking around all the time thinking about my gold medal. It was just beautiful poetry was received, beautiful poetry was offered, a gold medal was changed hands, but there's no... Um, there's no continuing energy pattern in relation to that unless the I grabs a hold of it and defines itself. But much more likely, when I win the gold medal for the poetry that I wrote, it registers. Maybe it registers in the heart chakra as a feeling of expansive joy. What a joy it is to share this poetry. And the emphasis is on the joy of the fact that everybody enjoyed this poetry. What if it, if it re registers at the third chakra? Is it now that I've won the gold medal? You know, people are going to have to listen to me when I talk about poetry. And I'm going to leverage that influence, you know, into some other things that I really want to see happen. So the event has happened. And there are many different ways that that event could be uh, received, and it is received according to the rest of my energy pattern as to who I am. So let's say um, it's registered at my third chakra, and what I feel from having won a gold medal is an increase in personal power. Now, not an increase in personal power that goes upward to being more loving, to being more expansive, ultimately to being in tune with God, if I move all the way to the sixth chakra, it's personal power that if people recognize me and give me gold medals, there's a lot of other things I want. And, of course, the reason we do it is because we think that we'll have more happiness and less suffering if I have personal power. But this is not exactly true. There are many things wrong with that perception. First of all, where did the inspiration come from? Will you actually be happier if you have more power? How important is it to get gold medals? Or is your self-worth really dependent on whether you get gold medals or not, or have power over people? When we were first starting our, our Living Wisdom School here in Palo Alto, which is now, we're in our 30-some years here, we did some, uh, I say we, because I was, I was instrumental in the founding of that school. Um, I'm not a school teacher, but I, I'm an entrepreneur, so we, I was instrumental in getting going. And we went around and visited some of the local schools, the uh, schools that we thought might be a little more in tune with what we were doing, partly just to see where we might fit, you know, in the educational community. Also, just, just to get a feel for things. So we went to what is considered to be one of the most prestigious and most progressive. It wasn't Waldorf, which is um, a little more aligned with us. but It was just a private school, but it was considered to be very progressive in the ways that we would consider progress. And one of the things that they had 
in their elementary school, and it was about a fourth grade uh, program. They had a bulletin board, and they had a, a self-esteem tree. And each of the children, which was like 25 or 30 kids in these classes, had made a leaf for the self-esteem tree, and they'd put it on the tree, okay? There were, like I said, more than two dozen leaves on that tree, and, and I, and perhaps we, stood carefully, and I read every single one of them. Let's say there were 26. 25 of them were that the children felt that they were worthy human beings because they had accomplished something external. I got 100% on my spelling test. I kicked the winning goal at the soccer game. You know I'm way ahead in my math book. This was a school in which they juried the children for IQ, so everybody was a high achiever. And everybody was claiming their self-esteem because of what they had accomplished externally. One child said, I'm not as moody as I used to be. You know, just spoke of some inner victory that had to do with their actual ongoing character. Now, of course, the problem with what they were doing, great that these kids are excelling academically and so on. You know, sure, why not? But everyone who was basing their self-worth on the external events of their life, which just works great until you get fired and then you can't get a job or you get blackballed for something that you never did or you have a brain injury and all of a sudden you can't work in exactly the same way. You, you know, just make a list. When, when the external world, which is ever unreliable, does its inevitable thing, which is the only certainty is change, and you've been trained since you were in the fourth grade to believe that your self-worth depends on what you accomplish externally and how the world recognizes you. This is called karma because it's an unlearned lesson. And those children being trained to think that way, they're building vrittis in their spine, and the vritti is a center point of energy, which is, it makes me happy because, I avoid suffering because, the reality of who I am is this. So you, you, you plant a, a magnetic center point, that's your, the center of your vritti, and then a great many other things begin to happen around that center point. A great many other things, like it, where you put your energy, what causes you to have happy feelings, how you relate to the people around you, um, how you relate to your parents, the, the professional choices you make, the kind of spouse you, choice, you, you, you choose, how you raise your own children, whether you have children, you know, just watch. Because there's a center point, and then you keep making decisions based on that center point, and pretty soon an enormous amount of energy whirls around. This is the vritti. Just think of a, in, in a river, the river is cheerfully heading down to the sea. And then a big tree falls into a corner of it. The tree creates an obstruction to the free flow of that river toward the ocean. And so now, a great deal of the river instead of doing its appointed destiny, which is to merge into the sea, spins around the fallen tree. And the more it spins, the more powerful it gets, and more of the river keeps having to go into it. Now, you can kind of like try to pull the water back into the river, maybe you get a little bit in, but what you really want to do is you want to go in there and you want to pull out that dead tree. You want to remove the center point that causes all that energy to be deflected from its primary purpose. That, that is a vritti, that is an unlearned lesson about where my happiness really comes from. That's karma, that's what it is. And it, it's, it's marvelously mysterious because we are often a mystery. That's what makes it mysterious, is that we are a mystery to ourselves. Now, I'll give you an example that I learned when I was 18 19. I always want to, I, I like to tell the truth. 19. Yeah, I was 19. Um, I went to live in New York City with friends. I was, I, I had just been introduced to the spiritual path. I was very deep into it. I hadn't yet, I hadn't yet met, met Swami. No, I hadn't met him. I met him the following year. Met him six months after this happened, actually. Um, and, uh, we went to New York City because we had friends there, and we we, we, we were we were following Jesus's 
uh, instructions without realizing it, which is to go out and share the good news. So we had discovered the meaning of life, so we were going to meet a friend in New York City, spend the summer living there, to tell him the good news, because we had discovered an enormous secret about where happiness comes from and what causes suffering, which was the path of self-realization. It, it crystallized for me when I met Swami, but it started before I met him. Now let me get this whole story straight. Um, I was raised in a very good home, and uh, I, I, have, I have nothing but gratitude for the family I was raised in. But my father, especially, was very conflict-averse. And so I, I grew up thinking, I was a, I was a debater, there were, certain, there were certain environments in which I would be very forceful. Um, but nonetheless, deep within myself, I was very conflict-averse, and I felt that if people actually started yelling at each other, it was probably the end of the world. And so it was extremely important for me to keep the world from ending. So I, I was accommodating. Um, people who know me now might find that incredible, but that is in fact exactly what I was. And uh, so I ended up in New York City, and I began to realize that what appeared to be an accommodating personality was not really that I was nice. It was that I was afraid. And so let's think about a vritti. There's a center point in that vritti. Now, I thought the center point of my vritti was that I was nice. But the center point of my vritti was not that I was nice. The center point of my vritti was that I was afraid in, in many circumstances, not all, but many circumstances to contradict, to stand up, to assert what was appropriate. So I, there were a lot of things in my life, that I, some of which I did not solve that summer in New York City. I, but, but there were a lot of things in my life that had all been attracted because of the center point of fear of conflict. So I'm a California girl now. I, I grew up in Texas, actually, until, my, until I was 15. But I'm a California girl. You know, we're mellow in California. You know, I live in the Bay Area. We're nice. New York City is different. Let's just put it like that. So it was a perfect place to learn to just speak up in the smallest ways. I mean, literally, I went to the grocery store and I saw that the clerk, when he was weighing my vegetables, was pushing on the scale with his thumb. <laughs> you know, just because I'm very observant, he was just, you know, adding a few ounces so that he could get a little more money from me. I just watched him do it, never said a word. You know, I'm in the grocery line. The grocery store became the place where I began to learn a lot of things. I'm in the grocery line. I'm standing there, I'm in line, and some, you know, hussy just comes in and cuts in front of me. And I just let her cut in front of me because I'm nice. But I wasn't nice. I was afraid. So I decided, okay, I need to learn the lesson of not fearing conflict. And so I started practicing where there was nothing at stake. You know, this the, the clerk in the grocery store, I, who cares? And in New York City, when you say, hey, buddy, take your thumb off the scale, the grocer just laughs, nice try. You know, I mean, it's like nobody cares. In California, it would just be a huge scene. In New York, nobody even notices. When the gal tries to cut in front of me and I just elbow her side and push forward and tell her to get behind me, once again, we're just having a like, you know, it's a morning, we're talking to each other, you know, it's nothing. So I began in perfect environment to dis dismantle that vritti. That summer I was never actually able to stand up in the arenas where I really needed to, but I started. I diminished. I diminished the fear. And what happens when you diminish the, the power of the center of the vritti is that a lot of the energy that's just been spinning around this issue because we have to constantly keep it alive. We have to make sure that no conflict arises and tremendous amount of subconscious energy goes to keep this one going. This is called denial. This is called all kinds of things that people have words for. But it's, it's an energy vampire is what these vrittis are. So then I want to go forward in something that appears unrelated. To, to, to write a book or things that I started doing later in my life or have a healthy relationship. And for some reason, I just can't find the energy to do it. And I'm, I, I want to, but I have 
karma over here, unresolved karma that prevents the success, which all sounds, again, very mysterious. But when you think of it like this, it's not. I'm, I'm, I have it locked energy over here, so I don't have access to it. You, you can think of it like my creative project, my desire to, well, let's, I, I mentioned to form a relationship, to relate properly to people, to be appropriate with my children, to rise in my company, you know, to develop my singing voice, whatever it might be, it's going to require the capacity to use my willpower to direct that energy in a certain way. And so I have to have access to that energy. And in order to have access to that energy, I have to figure out why so much of the river is not flowing to the sea, but just seems to be hanging around somewhere where I don't know where it is. Now, this is the, sort of a small picture of what this is about, and just, you know, through New York. Let me finish New York, because it was actually very funny. Um, I got quite good at that. I got so that I just defended my rights, and I defended my turf effortlessly. <laughs> Then I began to enjoy it. <laughs> and so I was no longer afraid of that kind of conflict. And here I'm making another vritti over here. And this vritti is, you know, I have a third chakra that's really raging now, and don't you mess with me, buddy. And like that became my new self definition and my new uh, source of happiness. But by then I was a little more alert and I said, no, 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 no. Now I'll be nice because I don't, I mean, I'm not going to let the guy steal from me in the grocery store, but the lady is more of in a hurry than I am. Let her have it because fundamentally, actually, I am nice, you know, I'm not fighting for my position and all those sorts of things. But now the center of my vritti was not fear. It was a conscious choice that this kind of behavior brings me more happiness genuinely because I'm not just um, contracting myself into the smallest version of myself, but I'm willing to see myself as part of a greater reality. And what pleases my brothers and sisters also pleases me. So I'm now I'm moving up the chakras from this thought that from this ego perspective that it's all about me at least toward the spiritual eye perspective that we're all in this together and how can we help now what happens to us is over the course of one incarnation i mean think about it people the um, psychiatrists and psychologists at a certain point and i'm I'm not a student of, I'm extremely knowledgeable in a very narrow area, and I have little random bits of information in others, and I know that in psychology, which I've never studied formally, of course, a great deal of self-realization goes into the field of human psychology, but I know that there was a certain point when psychologists began to realize that even though you couldn't remember what happened to you in your childhood, your childhood was influencing you. So wait just a moment. Oh, yes. So in the course, you know, of one lifetime, um, things happen. I was reading a, a very interesting book. Just I'll just, I'll just promote it a little because it was so fascinating. Turns out it was published in 1974, so it's been around a while, by a man named David St. Clair, and it's called Psychic Healers. If you happen to just be somewhere where you can find that book, if you're at all interested in the subject, it was, it was, it's very well done. It was fascinating. And, and, you know, just these psychics often helped by people on the other side who, who have perception, they can just see this whole pattern of the vrittis. And, and what I was, was saying, there was this one who was a psychic psychiatrist. And he didn't work physically, but he used his psychic ability to help people tune in. And they gave multiple examples of how, how some traumatic thing happened to someone when they were very young, which, I mean, this is common knowledge now, which just gave them a world view that they had followed ever since. Unexamined, unaware, but a very strong vritti had been created because this is, you know, this mother-father-child relationship can often define your expectations of reality. But of course, when you take in reincarnation, it's like, why were you born to that situation? Because you had an unlearned lesson. 
And that unlearned lesson has to do with where does suffering come from? What causes happiness? Who am I? And if one has this inclination to feel a certain way, I, I, I was very interesting. I'll use myself again as an example. It took me a long time to figure out because you would think, I mean, and this is how I used to think. My father was very, very disciplined and very organized. My mother was more of a free floater. I, I've had to learn, and it's been a long project for me, to learn to be disciplined. And I'm still uh, flaky. <laughs> I've, written, I've published four books. Three of them are, are, are little vignettes. They're little stories, each one. Um, two of them are stories, one of them are questions and answers. But, it, but they're, they're complete, they're entirely discrete, complete little sections. And that was how I was able to write, because I could concentrate very deeply in short bursts. So I, I, when I share these books, I say, this is for people with a short attention span like mine, you know? <laughs> you can just, and in like five minutes, you can read a whole story and then you're done. You don't have to, you don't have to care for any longer than that. I'm, I'm joking, but only partially. So I, this is a quality of mine, which, I, as you know, as I reflect on my life, I realized I could have emulated my father, but for some reason I didn't. But... The other aspect, that was one. So I would often think, why wasn't I born into a family of highly disciplined, regulated people so that I could learn to be highly disciplined and regulated? Well, this is what I've come to understand. Until, well, my friend Shivani put it this way, so I'll quote her. She says, until you're absolutely disgusted with the quality in yourself, don't even try to overcome it, because you won't. <laughs> So what I've seen is we come in with the vritti, we carry it because, as I've talked earlier in this cycle, the chakras are the energy pattern and that energy pattern manifests the physical world. You know, not, not just the physical body, but also um, the conditions, the relationships, everything. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So we come in pushing in a certain direction because it's the momentum that we've had and we often come into a situation that doesn't counter it but exacerbates it. It exacerbates it so that the it will, it will become more and more intensely we'll become more and more intensely conscious of how much of our river is flowing into this whirlpool to the point where it really interferes with our life. And, and then the suffering that we imagine will come to us in the effort to overcome it is now less than the suffering we will endure if we don't. And that is the tipping point. And that's when we move. Okay, my friends, more tomorrow. God bless you.